Well, the Lord has given me some things to think about, and he's given me some things he wants me to share with you. Um, and I'm going to have the morning prayer this morning. Uh, Lane gave me a book. It's inspired by the War Room uh, movie. It's called The Battle Plan for Prayer. And I would like to read just a, a little bit out of it. In April 1948, a farmer in a small rural town in South Georgia looked up to see a tornado approaching his property. As he ran for cover, his wife crowded their three young daughters under the dining room table and waited in fear. When the devastating twister arrived at their house, the little girls watched their mother cry out to God at the top of her voice for protection. Moments later, the deafening train-like sound of the winds faded into the distance, and then the family walked outside to see the aftermath of the storm. The destruction was all around them. Their barn, a few yards away, was heavily damaged. Power lines were down on the ground. The giant oak trees in front of their house were uprooted, now laying on their side. And the church across the street had been rocked off its foundation. But their home and family were left completely untouched. The farmer and his wife were our grandparents and their six-year-old daughter, who was greatly impacted by the experience grew up to become our mother. So God used this tornado to touch this family and he, it wasn't the mother, but it was the granddaughter that wrote the book. And a few years ago there was a tornado in, uh, in Washington and I heard from a man that I know that his father went to a church and this girl that, that went to their church was in the tornado and the house was destroyed around her and the part of the floor that she was on was lifted up and set into the street about 300, 300 feet or so from the house and she just had a few scratches on her. And I think what the Lord is, is wanting me to share with you is that he answers prayer in different ways. The Galandis, they didn't get the answer that they were hoping for. Ben and Annie didn't get the answer that they were hoping for. And uh, I'm also thinking about Cheyenne. She has, her and her family have not gotten the answer that we would like for them. But I would like for us to pray for all three of these because God is still God and he's still working. For, for Cheyenne, you know, the, there's more to, we don't know what's going to happen, but there is more to life than our physical bodies. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given. We thank you that you are God and that you alone are God. We thank you that you are with us in such a way. We ask that you would be with Cheyenne and her family. We ask that you would show them that you have not abandoned them. We ask that you would show them that you love them very deeply. We ask that you would be with Ben and Annie. We ask that you would uplift them and show them that you love them and care for them and you have great plans for them. We ask also, Lord, for this church that you would uh, just be with the man and his family that you have for us as a pastor. We ask that you would prepare him uh, for coming here, we ask that you would help him to be completely in your will. We ask that you would be with us as Bear Township Church, that you would prepare us, uh, well, Lord, as well, that we would be completely in your will. And that when we do have a pastor, 
that it would be a great thing and that the gospel of Jesus Christ would shine brightly for you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Bill. That always takes a lot of courage. I thought this would be appropriate this morning. <laughs> it says, uh, casual day at the funeral parlor. The, uh, the guy in the casket, I told my wife when I die, please bury me in sandals and a Hawaiian shirt and, and tell everybody coming that'll be the uh, dress code for the day. I didn't think you'd do it, to be honest with you. I really didn't think you'd do it. You really are starting to loosen up a little bit, aren't you? In fact, uh, just to prove to my wife that this really happened, I'm going to take a picture. And she's going she's gonna to not believe it. Now, Charles, he really stands out there. That's one of the classier ones I've ever seen. <laughs> so this morning, thanks Ben for helping me with that, um, I want to talk to you about a subject that I think is always relevant, and that's forgiveness. Now, you may say this morning, I'm not aware of any dispute that I have with anyone. Maybe not. But I know that at some point, either in the past or in the future, you will. It's part of life. And when I look at what the Scripture says about what it means to forgive, I think what's unfortunate, and please don't hear this as being jaded or as an axe to grind, but I've, I've been in the ministry 33 years. And here's what my observation is. Often forgiveness is some, for some reason harder in the church than it is even in the secular world. And I don't get that. This is a subject we need to understand or we never can really understand our own forgiveness before God for our sin. Isn't it interesting that we typically see offering forgiveness to someone as some big giveaway that will somehow cause us to subjugate the power of our life to that individual and they get to go free in their guilt while we live with the emotional pain and the train wreck that they've created in our lives. Isn't that how you often see it? So what do we do with that? Well, let's look at the scripture. Now what prompted this question by Peter was that just prior to this in the Greek paragraph, Jesus is talking about how to settle a dispute in the church. I'll guarantee you churches don't follow Matthew 18. I'll guarantee you they don't. If you have a dispute, you're supposed to go one-on-one -on -one to that person. If that doesn't work, you're supposed to take someone from the church with you. If that doesn't work, you bring them before the church and you deal with it. Okay? So Jesus is talking about that in the verses prior to verse 21. Then Peter gets the bright idea of asking this profound question, which probably all the disciples wanted to ask. Then Peter said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but seventy times seven. For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle account with his slaves. When he began to settle them, one owed him 10,000 talents and was brought to him. But since he didn't have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. Now that was one thing that was done back in those days. The family got sold into slavery and the man did slave labor. 
So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. Just, in just a minute, I'll give you the numbers on this. It's, it's staggering when you consider it. So he owes him a hundred denarii, which is typically a hundred days' wages. Okay, And he said, I forgive you because I've been forgiven so much. story would end there and we wouldn't even have a sermon if that were the case. And he seized him and he began to choke him saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, have patience with me and I'll repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him into prison until he should pay back what he was owed. So here's what happened. There's a couple of guys hanging around the courthouse and they see what's going on, and your sin will find you out. So they go and they report to the slave owner what's going on. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father, don't miss this. I don't have to mince words here. Jesus said it straight the first time. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Now, let's talk about these slaves for a minute. If you take today's average USA income, which on the average, if you look it up and do the research, is somewhere around $51,939. Okay? Multiply that by what the first slave owed, 15 years wages, okay? So I don't know how much that would have been in ancient Jerusalem. I didn't have the patience to wade through all the stuff I saw trying to find the answer. All I wanted was numbers. And I'm like a psychologist, just give me the numbers, I can't read a paragraph. I don't have time for that. But I couldn't find that. But here's what I did. I translated it into today's language. What that slave owed in our economy was $800,000. Now, how many people you know have $800,000 of disposable income laying around that they could pay back? $800,000. Again, in today's world, you know what the other slave owed? $14,000. $800,000, $14,000. Big difference. In fact, the man that owed 800000 there is no way. I mean, he pleaded and said he was going to repay it. There is no way. The man could have lived several lifetimes, and he could have never done it. Somehow, he had cooked the books and embezzled this money and stole to the tune of this big number, 15 years wages in ancient Israel. And there was no way once he was found out that he could pay it back. But he pleads anyway. And isn't that way with us? We have nothing, nothing to offer God. Nothing. But when we come to Him in salvation, we plead on the basis of our sin and our inability to do anything about it. And He forgives us, even though there isn't one thing that we can offer in return that's going to make any difference. And yet He loves us so much He forgives us. Where do we miss it when it comes to people? Are you with me? Where do we miss it? You see, forgiveness 
Let's look at what it is, and then let's, let's talk about what it isn't. Okay, first of all, it's a virtue of God demonstrated by him in our behalf. Okay? Secondly, it's most often, and this is, this is where it's hard for us, all right? It's most often an act of the will in direct opposition to how you feel. Now, clinically, that's why we talk about dialectical behavioral therapy. You're saying, what? When we talk about dialectical behavioral therapy, we talk about the hemispheres of the brain. You're feeling one way, but intellectually you know you should be doing something different, and the inability to reconcile those is where the problem is. And so what we try to do is teach people how to reconcile that. And the first place to go is the Bible, because the Bible's more compatible with DBT than Buddhism, even though Buddhism would say they created it. Go figure. Number three, it has the power to bring closure to difficult and unfinished business. Boy, do I know that. It's not the same as forgetting. Don't forget that. You will not forget because God has given you the capacity to remember many things. Even in Alzheimer's patients, my mother-in-law right now can remember in grave detail things from her childhood and early in life, but not remember where she put her keys just a few minutes ago. Our brains are phenomenal. They remember. So it isn't about forgetting. Five, at times, not always, at times it has the power to heal relationships and bring reconciliation. And then number six, it has the power to set you free. Now let me give you an illustration. In 1958, three years after the Korean War, a young South Korean, not North Korean, South Korean student came to the University of Pennsylvania to further his studies. His family had the ability to, even post-war, save up enough money to get him a ticket to the U.S. And he had applied for scholarships and he was attending the University of Pennsylvania. He went down one evening, early in the evening, to mail a letter back home to his parents. When he got there, there were 11 gang members, white gang members waiting for him. They proceeded to beat him with chains and tire irons until he was unrecognizable and left him dead by the mailbox. Once the authorities began to search back through all the details, several weeks later they rounded up and arrested all 11 of those individuals. They contacted the family in Korea. And this is what they said, quote, Our family has met together, and we have decided to petition that the most generous treatment possible within your laws be given to those who committed this criminal action. In order to give evidence of our sincere hope contained in this petition, we have decided to save money to start a fund to be used for the religious, educational, vocational, social guidance of these boys when they are released from prison. We have dared to express our hope with the spirit received from the gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for our own sins. You say, is that real? Yes. Yes, it is. It's a documented story. It didn't come off the internet. It's true. How does someone do that? I mean, that's, that's brutal. That's, that's murder. What about when you've been wrong? In the work I do, a lot of time it's an ex-spouse. 
that needs to be forgiven. Sometimes it's a son or a daughter that needs to be forgiven. A sibling. Do you know how many family rivalries I preside over in the course of a year? Especially when there's an estate to be settled? Brings out the worst of everybody. What about a neighbor? What about your previous pastor and wife? Is everybody clear there? I'm not saying anything I know. So if I'm speaking to something that's out of total ignorance, Holy Spirit's my witness. But I wonder about that. Here's the thing. If you're holding on to something like that, God cannot bless you or the congregation until you reach a point where you understand this isn't a great giveaway. It isn't letting someone off the hook It's letting yourself out of jail because you're the one who's in prison. When I left my last church, there was one particular family. Husband and wife, daughter and her husband. They were exceptionally difficult in the last few months. And after attending that church for 50 years, they decided to make a statement, and they left four months before I did. I didn't understand. It didn't make sense to me. I had been above board in my communication with them. I didn't know what else I could do. And when they left, they didn't know what to do with it, and I left it alone. And that was September of 2005. Four years later, I received a letter in my mailbox at work. And it was from the daughter. Please forgive me and my family for how we treated you. It was unfair, it was inappropriate and we're sorry. No, I'm not going to do that. They cost me my reputation with some people. No. I sent back to the address. It was her work address. I sent back and I said, please know you've already been forgiven. This is just confirmation of what God is doing in your life. Thank you so much. And she sent a picture of their one and only son. And I said, by the way, your son's very handsome. Thank you for the picture. I've been on that end, and I've been on the other end when I've had to go and say, please forgive me. I've been a schmuck. I I need your forgiveness. You see, folks, this question is so important because this unknown author said this. When forgiveness denies that there's anger, acts as if it never happened, smiles as though it never hurt, fakes as though all is forgotten, don't offer it, don't trust it, don't depend on it, it's not forgiveness, it's magical fantasy. Don't forget that quote. When it's really grounded in Christ, I am willing to admit that it hurt, that I was disappointed, that it caused me a lot of heartache, but in spite of that, I forgive you. It's about being real. When people just flippantly forgive, they really haven't. They've given lip service to something, but their heart hasn't really changed. Because when we're hurt at the depth that this scripture implies, or that so far the illustrations I've given you have depicted, 
There is a depth going on that admits the hurt and the pain. You have to admit that if you don't, then you're really not doing forgiveness. That's not how you come to God, is it? Aren't you hoping when you leave that place of prayer that you realize you've delivered your soul and you feel the best that you know how that God has met you in that place? It's got to be real. When it's not real, it's magical fantasy. And when Peter asked the question, he thought he was being unusually generous. There was one rabbinical philosophy in that day that was prevailing at the time Jesus taught this. You know what they said? You don't have to forgive someone the fourth time. If your countryman or your fellow worshiper offends you, after three times, you don't have to forgive them again. So, Peter thought he was being unusually generous. Seven is twice by one. Seven times. And seven is the number of perfection in Jewish thinking. There it is. I answered my own question. Are you proud of me, Jesus? Jesus says, no. Seventy times seven. Now, it's never a math whiz, but I think that's 490. But that isn't what that means. That is a Jewish hyperbole, which means ad infinitum. Always and forever, you forgive. There's not an occasion when you do not forgive. The reason I think this is so important is because in all my travels over the years, I have struggled watching people get miffed and angry and leave churches feeling they've been justified while the other side says, good riddance, don't come back. Or I've seen another side say, please come back, please come back, and then they cater to that person and lay out the red carpet and that person comes back and they take control of things. When true forgiveness has been offered and experienced, and it is indeed a two-way thing, there is humility, there is acceptance, and there is repentance and a willingness to try again in a more holy way. Now there are some times that forgiveness has to be unilateral. Meaning, you might forgive someone and they don't even know it, and you may not have the opportunity to ever talk to them again. As in the case of some of my clients when a spouse has died. Or when a mom or dad has passed away. And they never reconcile. Sometimes it's got to be unilateral. But at some point in time, you have to let yourself out of the jail. There's no get out of jail free card here. It's about forgiveness. And forgiveness is difficult, first of all, because we have a sinful nature. We want our way. We want to be acknowledged. We're easily hurt. We want you to take responsibility. I'm teaching you responsibility when I don't forgive you. <laughs> no, you're not. You're just being a curmudgeon is all you're doing, among other things. Forgiveness is also hard because of the emotional toll it takes on us. As I said a moment ago, it often doesn't make sense with intellectual thought. I'll tell you, the first time that I really encountered this, I mean really encountered it, I, I'd heard some namby-pamby stuff over the years as a, as a preacher. You argued over the color of the carpet or where to put the water fountain? Are you serious? I was preaching at the Davis County Fairgrounds in Iowa. It was a seven-day meeting. I was the speaker, and there was an African-American fellow from Des Moines who actually flat out could sing. I thought he was Nat King Cole revisited. He was, he was good. He's doing the music, 
And I was doing the preaching. And on the last night of this seven-day meeting at this fairgrounds, in this huge crowd, there was a young lady that caught my attention that came to the altar on this side. There was something about her that bothered me. And finally, the lady who was with her said, could you please come down here and help us? And she looked up into my eyes and she said, I got a problem. I haven't forgiven the man that raped me. And I don't know how to do that. Wow. Forget your platitudes. I was practicing counseling 101 at that point before I ever got a master's degree. Trying to help her through that moment. To make a long story short, I felt satisfied when she got up and left. I gave her what amounted to a treatment plan to start moving through this. And I felt confident that she would because she was so serious about wanting to do that. Isn't that awesome? Ladies, how hard would that be? I was stunned. And yet she told me, if I don't do this, I don't feel like I can grow in my relationship with Christ. As awful as it was, I want to be free in Christ. That was her concern. Our emotions will take us all over the place. So it's hard because we have a sinful nature. It's hard because of our emotions. It's also hard because we have wonderful memories. And it's funny what we do remember, right? And I'm not talking about having any kind of dementia now. I'm talking about just the average person whose mind is high functioning. Isn't it interesting what details we'll pull out of something and what we'll remember? So here's the thing. Because our memories are awesome, because our emotions are so powerful, and because we have a sinful nature, we've got to come to a conclusion now. God, here's my axiom, God must be able to help you in any and all situations of wrongness and injustice, or he would not ask you to forgive ad infinitum whenever you are offended in some way. Why would he ask us to do something we couldn't do? We sell God short, don't we? Well, you don't understand God. You know how unfair that was. You don't understand it all. You don't understand the lies that were told. You don't understand how much vitriol there was. You don't understand the anger. You don't understand the, the, the angst and the words and how deeply they cut. You don't understand God how how unfair this is. Some of you may even need to forgive people you've never met because they've had some role in your future. Employment, financial, otherwise. Do you know how I used to feel as a pastor? How unfair it was? Out of the four churches that I pastored, two of them, in 23 years of pastoring, two of them were absolutely, absolutely the most difficult challenges I've ever faced. And when God's people hurt you, I, there was a point where I was so jaded that I left the ministry for 10 months because I had to get my brain reoriented to my apparent naivete that people don't hurt you when you're in the church. Yes, they do. You have to forgive me, I was only 29 at the time. 
I'm almost 59 with a lot of gray hair now. It makes a big difference. And I realized that if I was going to go on the rest of my life and follow God's call to ministry, I would have to get past all of that somehow in a real and clear way. Not in some sort of magical way. Not in this fantasy that this unknown author is talking about. I had somehow come to that place. And you know what I do every time I struggle with that? I'm reminded of how much God's forgiven me and I don't deserve it. That's the place I have to anchor back into. God, you have forgiven me so much. How can I not forgive this person? You know what helps? When you start employing a little empathy. If you've never received empathy, you probably don't know how to give it. Empathy is starting to understand the bigger picture of someone else's operation. You're not necessarily excusing them, but it helps to explain. You know, you don't know what that person is going through. You don't know whether they just got fired. You don't know whether they're not getting along with their spouse or whether they're having with a neighbor, employment, or boss. You, you, you might be to any of that. On some occasion, they can uncharacteristically act in ways that are hurtful. And it blows you away. But empathy says, I've got to understand more about them to see why they went where they did. I had a client just this past week. She's an RN. She's a brilliant lady, and she does a lot of work. She's got a son with special needs. Not only does he have some mental challenges and born that way, but he's also had cancer. And they've struggled with him. And we were working with some things with her and her husband, and it got to be 10 minutes before the hour, and she said, I just want you to know that I'm really upset where this session is gone. And I'm angry. And I said, I don't blame you. I said, let's talk about that. And I spent the next 15 minutes, went past the hour, talking to her, and when we got done, she said, you know what made it safe for me to say that to you? I knew that you'd be okay with that. I trusted you. That you wouldn't get angry. And that you would forgive me because of how I was feeling. That's probably the highest compliment I got paid all week. Addicts aren't really happy to give you a compliment. <laughs> I'm their worst nightmare most of the time. You see, folks, I didn't come to that place because I'm such a wonderful person. Don't get that impression. I know me better than anybody. It's taken a lot of years, a lot of hard road, a lot of difficult situations to work through to get to the point where I could absorb something like that. But when someone is upset with you, don't think about yourself first. Think about them. Do you know how much that will change you? What are they going through? What are they experiencing? What's making them tick right now? You see, empathy really walks in somebody else's shoes because you want to understand what it's like to be them. That's true empathy. And the other side of it is, when my personal wrongness hurts you, my personal wrongness hurts me so much that you're hurt, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to try to solve it. All right, a couple concluding thoughts. I could preach on this another Sunday, actually. I don't know, I might. That might explain next week when there's only 10 people here. <laughs> Back when the Sunday School Convention was in the Civic Center downtown, I was asked to come and present on this subject for the Antioch group. Now, this is a Christian group, obviously, the Sunday School Convention. These are sharp people. They gave me a room with... with 45 seats. I had 72 people attend my seminar. It must be an important issue for people to deal with. 
All right, two concluding thoughts. Now, this comes from Cloud and Townsend, their book, Boundaries. Excellent book, by the way. They say this about forgiveness. Warning. Forgiveness and opening yourself up to more abuse are not the same thing. Forgiveness has to do with the past. Reconciliation and boundaries have to do with the future. Limits may guard my property until someone is truly repented and can be trusted to visit again. And if they sin, I will forgive them 70 times 7. But in all honesty, I want to be around people who honestly fail me, not dishonestly deny that they've hurt me and appear to have no intent to do better. If people are owning their sin and they're learning through their failure, we can ride that out. They want to do better, and our forgiveness will help them. But if someone is in denial or only giving lip service to getting better without really trying to make changes or seeking help, I need to keep my boundaries even though I've forgiven them. I wanted to be sure I covered that, because no doubt I'm raising more questions today than answers. And then finally this. This is actually quite poignant since you recently had someone here from Rwanda. I've been to Africa. I didn't get into Rwanda. My sister has been to Rwanda. My niece has been to Rwanda. I was in four African nations, but I didn't get there. But this was a story that appeared in Christianity Today in April of 2004. This is what it said. A missionary shared with me the remarkable story of Deborah. I'm not even going to try to pronounce her last name. That's not one of my strong suits. Deborah was chronicled in a World Vision Australian video. Her son was murdered in an isolated act of ethnic vengeance three years after the genocide. Months after the killing, a young man visited Deborah, and he said, I killed your son. I'm here so you can take me to the authorities and let them deal with me as they will. I have not slept since I shot him. Every time I lie down, even though I don't know you, I have seen you praying for me. There's Bill's admonition to pray, right? Then Deborah did the extraordinary. I want to restore justice. Therefore, I'm asking you to replace the son that you killed. I'm asking you to become my son. When you visit me, I will care for you as my own. Today, that young man is an adopted member of her household. I don't know how else to describe forgiveness than that. How did she get to that place? A lot of prayer. A lot of prayer. This is a very delicate subject, folks. And for three weeks I've been laying with this in my mind. I just feel like this morning the Lord has just impressed me that I need to offer you an opportunity to pray. So we're going to sing our closing hymn. More about Jesus. I realize that's not a typical altar call song. That's all right. As you know, I'm not typical. And ladies, you can play it in the timing in which it's written. Don't worry about that. But we're going to sing more about Jesus. I want to open the altar. And I want us to pray if God's laid something on your heart this morning related to this subject.
No one will be intrusive and ask you why, while you're here unless you want to volunteer that. No one's going to bother you. But by coming forward, you'll be saying publicly, God spoke to me about this. And on Sunday morning at Bureau Township Community Church, 29 May 2016, I nailed down my problem with that person. Or maybe you need to forgive God. Maybe you're so angry at God that you've been shaking your fist at him. You come and pray. And I'll have a closing prayer with you. Let's stand. Mrs. Olson, lead us in this beautiful song. More about you. There's some that want to come and help us pray. Come right now. As Kathy continues to play. If there isn't, let's have a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you that in the economy of your grace and of your great wisdom, you inspired your word and the living word, Jesus, to bring this conversation to us today that's now in our canon of Scripture. Thank you that Peter asked the question. Thank you that you fleshed it out so clearly, so certainly. Would you help us today both individually, within our families if that's necessary, within the church if that's necessary, in our place of employment if that's necessary, in our neighborhood if that's necessary, but God, in every facet of our life where we touch people and we know there's an issue. We're not talking about wondering this morning. We're not talking about going around and asking forgiveness for something we never did. We're not talking about that kind of frivolous sensitivity. We're talking about knowing directly and for sure that there's an issue. And Lord, where you point that out, would you give us the courage and the wisdom and the discernment and the understanding of how to take care of that, per your word, with an attitude that's real, with an attitude that is Christ-like, and with an attitude that can offer reconciliation if that's possible. We know sometimes it's not. But if possible, Lord. So now may your spirit speak to us in the Sunday school hour, or as we go to our separate homes, may the power and presence of God's Holy Spirit guide us and go with us in all things. And until we meet again by your will, amen and amen. You're dismissed. God bless.